Open your Bibles to John chapter 6. We've been here a lot. Important section of scripture, a discourse where the Lord Jesus gives a lot of details about his mission, the will of the Father, God's grace and power. So grateful to see this room so full, even in Arizona's hottest summer ever. It is so hot up here, so I hope you'll forgive me wearing my t-shirt up here. Um, so we're in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 28. John 6, 28. Hear now the words of the living and the true God. When they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about Him, because He said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does He now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me. Unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Thus far is the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us now as we study your power, as we study the gospel, as we study your grace. Please get me out of the way. Bless your church. Teach your people by your spirit. Help us to see your holiness, our sinfulness, the true nature of our rebellion, and the power of your grace, your ability, God, to overcome even our own rebellion. Please help me to articulate it and to clearly communicate it from your word. Let people forget me and remember you and what you've taught them today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a powerful section of scripture. I've told you that John chapter 6 and John chapter 10 are the places that I go for satisfaction for my soul, for healing, for comfort. These are not little one-off statements of the Lord Jesus. They're long explanations about God's purpose, God's will, Jesus' mission. You have explanations here that should satisfy your soul. In those moments where you feel like God is so far off, in the moments where your circumstances seem so broken, so out of control, in those moments where you feel like you should just plunge into despair and God feels like he's at the edge of the universe, this is the truth. This is the true nature of the salvation of God's people. This is Jesus, the Lord of glory, God incarnate, articulating to people who saw him and his works. And he says, you've seen him and you still don't believe. And then he responds to their unbelief. Now, mind you, keep in mind, these are people who are hanging out around Jesus and the disciples. 
Many of them, we would have probably thought, probably a disciple of Jesus. There are people around Jesus. And he always has a way of whittling the crowd down. He always does. But he has people around him who are saying, like, we want this bread, give it to us always. And Jesus says, you've seen me, yet you do not believe. And then he says, in response to their unbelief, all that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father has given to me will come to me. And he says this, this is powerful, and I want to say this, if your tradition, if your system can't handle this, then don't call it biblical. Don't call it grace. Don't call it gospel. Any system that makes Jesus into a liar needs to be abandoned. Jesus is clear here. It's not muddy. It's not unclear. He actually articulates his mission. He says this, I have come down from heaven. Okay, God in the flesh has come here. And he says, not to do my will, but the will of him who has sent me. Now here's Jesus telling us as God incarnate, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, who has been in fellowship with the Father from all eternity, who condescended and took on flesh and became a servant to become obedient even unto death. He says this, this is the will of my Father. Here's why he sent me. This is what he wants for me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given to me. And he says he will raise us up on the last day. And Jesus tells them to stop grumbling among themselves. He tells them, because he's just told them, you don't believe, but don't worry. I've come down to do the will of the Father, which is to lose nothing of all that he has given to me. He says, the Father has given to me is greater than all. And he says, no one can come to me. No one has the ability. No one can come unless the Father who sent me draws him, that word's better to say, compels him to come to me. And he says, and I will raise him up. Notice this. It's not merely corporate. It's not a corporate perspective. It's very personal. It's very individual. No one can come unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up. That's very personal. Very personal. Jesus has a people that have been given to him by the Father. Remember that. Keep that in mind. If you resist against that, you're not resisting against the teaching of a Calvinist. You're resisting against the teaching of the Lord of glory. He says a people were given to him by the Father, and the will of the Father is that he lose none of them, but raise them up on the last day. If your system, if your theology, if your tradition has points in there that have Jesus losing people that were given to him by the Father. It is your tradition that needs to be abandoned. If you have a tradition that says God can have a people given to Jesus and that Jesus does not bring them or raise them up on the last day, it is your tradition that is an error. Jesus is clear here. That's his mission. And if you want to know what this study of grace is all about... If you want to know what Calvinism is all about, the five points of Calvinism, what are we really trying to defend here? Is it a man named John Calvin? I told you I've never read the man. Never did. I know James wants me to start reading him. Never read him. I was a Calvinist before I understood anything about the guy at all. What are we really defending here? Jesus and John 6. Why are we doing this? Because I want to defend the grace of God and the power of God and the Lord Jesus and his mission from John chapter 6. We can go to other places as well. But if you want to know what the study is fundamentally about, it's John chapter 6, John chapter 10. Passages like this, where Jesus talks about the intimate love that he has for his people. You see, this is not just theological gymnastics and games up here. This gets right down into the heart of the believer. This is the intimate connection and fellowship we have with Jesus, our shepherd, the Savior. You have these people given to Jesus by the Father. And Jesus says, go save them, lose none of them, raise them up on the last day. That's the mission of the Son. Can we really say that Jesus, the eternal God who created everything in existence, could be thwarted by the almighty will of the creature and not accomplish his mission? 
Jesus goes on in John chapter 10. Same discussion. Bigger points. He says that he's the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. He says he knows his sheep and they know him like Jesus knows the father. That kind of intimate relationship. He knows the sheep. He says that he'll never lose them. They're in his hand and nothing could snatch them from his hand. They're in the father's hand and nothing could snatch them from the father's hand. You see, that's the perspective of Jesus, God incarnate, about the people given to him by the Father that he will save and he will never fail to save. And somebody might say, man, that seems uber gracious. That seems so gracious and so powerful. That's bigger than I imagined. I'd say, you're getting close. You're starting to see it. That seems so intimate, so particular, so individual. That seems so mighty. I'd say you're getting really close. That's the gospel that we're talking about. And so why this series? I have no jealousy for the title Calvinist. I have no jealousy for the title Five Points of Calvinism. It is my goal as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to defend the biblical view of grace. The biblical view of the atonement of Jesus Christ. I find it offensive that people would want to defend a position on the atonement that robs it of its personal nature. I find it offensive to what the Bible teaches about the atonement that people would want to rob Jesus of his accomplishment in the atonement. It is finished means that. It is an accomplished redemption that truly saves This is vital. It's so important. It's not just intellectual games or theological gymnastics. It is very personal. It is very intimate. This is the stuff that challenges and changes you. It transforms you. It brings glory to Jesus. You see, our purpose here has been to defend grace. How gracious is God's grace? And this is important. Here's why. Please hear me on this. You got to get this. It's hard to spot sometimes because religion will often try to co-opt biblical language, biblical concepts and pour entirely different meanings into those things. You see it in Mormonism. They'll use terminology like Jesus Christ, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, salvation, gospel. But as you start to ask questions, you say, tell me about Jesus. You're using the word. You baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in Mormonism too. But what do you mean when you say Jesus? And they'll say, well, Jesus is our elder brother. He's the brother of Lucifer as well. He's the spirit offspring of Elohim and one of his goddess wives in the pre-existence. He's one God among many gods. Many Mormon prophets taught that he was a polygamist in his earthly ministry. He died, of course, a death. His atonement began in the garden, was finished on the cross, and ultimately your works are what's necessary for salvation. 2 Nephi 25, 23, by grace you've been saved. Every Christian goes, all right, after all you can do. There's always a distortion, a distortion of who Jesus is, a distortion of the grace of God. You look at a religion like Roman Catholicism that fell into apostasy. Rome teaches the necessity of God's grace. A lot of times you even have Protestants, evangelicals, that don't properly actually represent Rome. We say it's just a religion of works. It's all works-based. And of course, then the Roman apologist has you. They'll say, no, no, it says in all of our things here, the grace is absolutely necessary. You need God's grace at the beginning. We're all sinners and you must have grace at the start. And then all of a sudden now you have converts coming from here to there. Why? Because we've lied about Rome. They teach the necessity of grace. What do they deny? The sufficiency of God's grace. The sufficiency of God's grace. They take biblical concepts like grace and they say, no, we're sinners. We've got original sin. You need God's grace at the beginning, but it's not enough. There must be cooperation with that grace. There must be obedience and righteousness. It's not just the righteousness of Jesus Christ and his perfect life. It's somehow also you and what you do. We see all religion will do this. They'll pervert grace. They'll say, yeah, it's necessary, it's a start, but it's not sufficient. 
And that gets us to this question of irresistible grace. Of course, we've talked about TULIP and the acrostic and what we're doing here to unpack these. Are these biblical truths? Do they come from the Bible? We talked about the remonstrance, the protest of the followers of Jacob, Arminius, and the Arminians versus the Calvinists. Those are just names put over categories, names put over the fight itself. The question is, how gracious is God's grace? And is God's grace sufficient? Is it powerful enough to save? What they were really getting at was this concept, effectual call, effectual grace. Because here's the deal, when you hear irresistible grace, it seems easy to take down, doesn't it? Oh, wait, you're saying that nobody can resist God's grace? God's grace is irresistible? That's kind of a problem, Jeff, because I I drove here today and I saw quite a few people resisting the grace of God on my way up here alone. Also, I have Facebook and I see it every single day. Every 30 seconds on the rebound, I pull it up and then there's more people resisting God's grace. Now think about it. It is true, Jesus taught... He says, God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Here's the deal. God is gracious, according to scripture, to every person every single day. He is merciful every day. Let me just say this. It's actually an obscene, in some way of looking at it, amount of grace and mercy. Because here's the deal. If you're a rebel in God's universe, every breath that he causes you to have is mercy from his hands is graciousness from God. And every day that you are resisting God's will and sinning against your creator that you know is there, every breath is from God, every heartbeat is from God. He is sustaining you constantly. And yes, people are rebelling against God and his grace and his love on a daily basis. People resist God's grace. So what's with the irresistible grace? What it refers to is effectual grace and call. What's it referred to? Well, a summary is John 6. No man can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draws him, and I will raise him up. Who's he raised up? The one the Father draws. Who was that? The one who couldn't come. Why? Because of our sin. Effectual call is this concept. Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead. God made you alive together with him. By grace, you've been saved. You were by nature children of wrath. God made you alive. That when God speaks into death, he could bring life. The Bible teaches that we are dead in our sins and trespasses. By nature, children of wrath. Romans 3, none righteous, none who seeks for God. None who seeks for God. So just take those... In themselves, if there is none who seeks for God, if there is none righteous, if no one is able to come to God, Romans chapter 8, not even able to submit to God's law, you cannot do what's pleasing to God, then how does anybody come to Jesus to trust in him? How is this room filled with people who trust in Jesus Christ? And the answer is God's effectual grace. When God, at the beginning of creation, spoke into darkness... Let there be light. There was light. And when God spoke and said, let there be, there was. This is the God who is all powerful. He is the creator of all things. We are creatures. He is the creator. Nobody can thwart the purposes of the creator. And when Jesus comes in his earthly ministry, you have Jesus showing us in physical terms what the Son of Man is capable of in spiritual terms. He goes to a little girl that's been dead. They have professional wailers and weepers there. And Jesus says, little girl, arise. And she rises from the dead. When Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus, they said that he's stinking by this point. And Jesus says, roll away the tomb. And he speaks into that tomb, into death. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And there was death to life. Jesus can bring life from the dead. And when we talk about God's effectual grace, we're talking about when God gave a people to Jesus Christ, it was the will of the Father that Jesus loses none of them. And when we bring the gospel, we are the means of God to bring his elect to him. 
And when we preach the gospel, God empowers that message and he brings his people to life. They go from hostility towards God to now they can see and they trust in Jesus Christ freely. They freely trust in Jesus Christ because now their nature has been changed. And so we would say regeneration, God bringing to life is how people come to trust in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. Again, religion will teach the necessity of grace, but not the sufficiency of God's grace. We would argue the Bible clearly teaches the sufficiency of God's grace. You see, Rome says it again. You need grace, but it's not sufficient. Mormonism says it. You need grace. It's not sufficient. The Judaizers would have said it. Can we stop there for a second? Very important. Who are the Judaizers? Well, Galatians is a really important work from the Apostle Paul. Very short, get to know it. And in Galatians, this is the one where Paul opens up. And you know, he's normally, in, in Romans, it's amazing. It's like, it's like seven verses with no period. It just keeps going and going and going. He's like, uh, I'm so excited. I want to see you and impart some spiritual gift to you. And I thought he just, he wants to get to Rome and he's so excited. And in Galatians, it's kind of like, Hey, what's up? I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is really not another, but there's some who are troubling you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. You see, what was the issue there for Paul when he sends this letter and he has a very short opening, like, hello, how you doing sort of a thing? Guys, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel. The issue for Paul at the start was grace. That's what's being disrupted. The grace of God in the gospel. You're deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is really not another But there's some who are troubling you, want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And he says, look, here's the deal. If we or an angel from heaven should preach to you any other gospel, let God condemn me to hell forever. Let God condemn that angel to hell. Anathema, accursed, forever condemned by God. Strong words. What was the issue? Well, in summary, you had people known as the Judaizers. Who are teaching people, of course, God is a gracious God. Here's the deal. Please hear this. Do we really think that the Judaizers wouldn't have affirmed God's grace? They knew that Israel had been called out of all the nations in the world. Israel was uniquely called by God. He knew about the other nations, but he said, you only have I known You only has he chosen to enter into intimate relationship with. They knew this was a gracious relationship. These Jews knew the sins of the Jewish people and the grace of God over all the generations and all the centuries. The Judaizers did not deny the grace of God. But they taught, according to Paul, another gospel. So they were saying, oh yeah, all this is fine, but you got to do at least this one thing from the law. At least keep circumcision. At least this part. At least keep this part of the law in order to be a part of God's people, to be essentially righteous in his eyes. At least keep the Jewish circumcision. And Paul tells them, you'll never be justified like that. It is through faith apart from any work. And he says this in chapter 5. He says, if you do that... If you're choosing that route, other than faith in Christ and what he's accomplished alone, if you're choosing that route, even this one thing, he says, Christ has become of no benefit to you. You have become estranged from Christ. And he actually has some harsh words, some harsh words for people who would suggest there is any other way to be reconciled to God other through God, other than through God's grace and faith in Jesus Christ. He says, these people who are troubling you, they like to play with knives. They want to circumcise. He says, I hope they go all the way. I hope they cut themselves off. That means what you think. Harsh words, right? That's how serious. Paul starts and ends with some pretty serious words. Um, you go to hell, angel, preaching that false gospel. And let me go to hell if I preach that. And I hope that you cut 
yourself off playing with knives with this false gospel. Why? The grace of God in salvation is at stake. And so the question is, how gracious is God's grace? How gracious is it? How effective is it? How do we start this discussion? We started it at a point. The sovereignty of God. Then we went to the next point. Total inability. Total depravity. Now I'm not going to rehearse everything, but I want you just to consider some important points. They're incontrovertible. You can't get away from them. And every person that hears them has to, if they believe in God's word, as God's word, they have to acknowledge, yep, it says that. Yep, that's true. Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous. Nobody. There is none who seeks for God. Take that seriously. There's none who does good. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. That's us. That's everybody out there in the world. Romans chapter 1 says that everybody knows God. They suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness. They exchange God for idols. They are haters of God. You catch that? Haters of God. That's the condition. We hate God. Now, we don't wear it on our sleeves constantly. You don't have people always running outside yelling that they hate God. But God's assessment of every person outside of Jesus is they are haters of God, enemies of God, not righteous, non-God seeking. And in Romans chapter 5, you have the Apostle Paul giving humanity into two representatives. You're in Adam or you're in Jesus. Which one are you in? If you're in Adam, he says you are dead. Being an Adam is being outside of Jesus Christ. You're fallen. You're in the flesh. And Paul says this, in Adam, there is condemnation and there is death. In Jesus, there is the gift of righteousness and eternal life. There is life in Jesus, death in Adam. Who are you in? Two. Humanity is broken down into two groups. It's not white, yellow, red, black, Brown, it's humanity into two representatives, Adam or Jesus. You're either dead or alive. You're either dead or alive. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 about those who are in the flesh, get this, he says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot please God. If you are dead in Adam, in the flesh, you cannot please God. You cannot submit to God's law. You're not even able to do so. Seems pretty dark, doesn't it? Pretty desperate in that place. And of course, Jesus teaches us in John 6, 44, no man is able to come to me. Don't lose that. So important. That's from the lips of the Lord Jesus. No man is able to come to me. No man is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up. He raises up the one the Father draws. Here's the deal. Watch this. All religion that says, sure, you need the Father to draw. Here's, you're going you're gonna to have people watching this right now. Hello. Or this one. Hi. And they're going to say, no, no, God's grace is necessary. You, Yes, the Father has to draw you. Great. That's a fantastic acknowledgement. Praise God for that. But what's Jesus teach about it? He says, no one is able unless the Father draws, and I will raise him up. Who's he raise up? The one the Father draws. So if you acknowledge the Father has to draw, here's the question. Is the Father drawing everybody? Welcome to universalism. Because Jesus says he'll do what to the one the Father draws? He'll raise him up. That's my Savior. That's the grace that our God has. The true God can overcome deadness. The true God can overcome rebellion. The true God can overcome inability. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. The Father draws. The Son raises up. But we started this discussion with total depravity. Now here's what you have to get. And we're going to try to... Honestly, I have some verses to go through today. They're unavoidable. It says what it says. Put Put them into your treasury and just have them on the ready. For your own hope and peace. And also for those moments when you need to defend the gospel of God's grace. But you have to understand this. Pelagianism. There was a heresy that came into the Christian church early on, and it was called Pelagianism. We've done a lot of talking about it before, so I won't belabor it today, but Pelagianism teaches essentially a denial 
of original sin. People come into the world and they kind of come into the world in that fresh start, right? They can pull themselves up. People say about their bootstraps, they can sort of get themselves along the way. It's a denial ultimately what the Bible says about our condition and original sin. And it was put down by the church on the basis of scripture. The word of God easily refutes Pelagianism. And so Pelagianism is taken down. It's refuted. People know this is the biblical standard. This is false teaching. Okay, so praise God for men like Augustine of Hippo in his amazing defense of the nature of man outside of Jesus Christ and the necessity of God's regenerating grace in the life of a dead sinner. However, Pelagianism as a heresy is pretty easy to spot, isn't it? Right? Like how are you going to deny Romans 5? How are you going to deny Romans 8? Romans, or sorry, John chapter 6. How are you going to deny and sin my mother conceived me? How are you going to get away from that? It's hard to do. You know what? Compromise. Compromise. So maybe it's not Pelagianism. That's obviously not biblical. So how about we do something that looks like man has been tainted by sin. He is sinful, but he hasn't lost his ability to seek God and come to God in and of himself. Of course, there's some grace necessary, but he can still cooperate, right? It's called semi-Pelagianism. Also false, also an enemy of God's grace and power in the gospel as we herald it. So semi-Pelagianism is a compromise. You see, what we're talking about today in terms of getting these, these terms out so we understand them is a difference in salvation between monergism and synergism, Monergism, you know the word mono means one because we are monotheists, right? So one God. Monergism is the idea that there is one power, one force at work that ultimately brings about salvation over against synergism, which essentially all man-made religion is synergistic, right? Think about it. Name the religion and you'll find the synergism, right? The idea like God does his part, I'll do my part. God participates, I participate. We cooperate. There's sort of like two forces at work here together to bring about this end. We would argue the Bible teaches monergism. God saves. God saves effectively when God calls and brings to life. The question is, what does the scripture say? Amen? Yes? That should be our standard. We can find, brothers and sisters, this is a glorious thing. There are giants that we stand on in 2,000 years of church history. Giants. Giants. You guys can see this right now. It's a work in progress, but it's Athanasius. One of my favorites in church history. Athanasius contra mundum. Athanasius against the world. Yeah, as Pastor James said a while back, after Arianism was defeated and Nicaea happens, sometime, a short time later, essentially in history... One church uh, father says, it was like the whole world woke up and everyone was Arian. And who was standing? Athanasius. Athanasius contra mundum. He was standing against Arianism with the Trinity. And so we can thank God for his means of using Athanasius, the giant in history, for defending the Trinity. Praise God for that. Praise God for the victory of the Trinity because of Athanasius Contra Mundum. By the way, Athanasius is also the patron saint of post-millennialism, so you know why he's on my arm. But we have giants behind us. We do. And we have in history, you listen, here's the game people play. And this we have to get we have to get used to this. You just gotta be used to it. If you're talking to a Roman Catholic, they're gonna pull quotes from church fathers. They're gonna say, Oh, look, these church fathers believe this throughout history. You can pull from those same church fathers quotes that are consistent with scripture. And so you have fallible, uninspired men talking out of both sides of their mouths. Lo and behold, that's what uninspired people do, right? And so in church history, you can find giants saying amazing things throughout history. So the question is, what's your standard? Who's the ultimate authority? Who is it? Is it Ignatius? Irenaeus, Polycarp, Origen, Augustine, Athanasius, Eusebius. Who's going to be your authority? Uninspired men who often contradict themselves. They say glorious things and then they do face plants. Or what's your standard? Our standard is the ancient record of the church. 
Our standard is the inspired revelation of God. Holy men of God spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The nature of this revelation is divine. And here's the key. The creator of all the universe has the ability to speak and be understood. Amen? Yes? I find it so interesting that people... Listen, the final word I've saying this, and I think it's so important for us to grapple with. I find it so interesting that people will often say, as they're examining subjects and going through history, they'll often say things like, well, I know the scripture says, but you need the help of these guys over here to understand what the scripture says. And you know what's interesting about the person saying that? It's usually they're saying it standing there by themselves. Somehow this creature in front of me believes that they have the ability to communicate with me without an interpreter present, but they think the creator of the cosmos must have interpreters to be understood. You know what I call that? Arrogance. I, as a creature, have the ability to be understood without a pile of books and interpreters next to me, but the creator of all things, he needs interpreters or he can't be understood. Brothers and sisters, I repudiate that idea. Are teachers good? Amen. Do we need the gifts of teachers in the church? Amen. But those teachers are not the standard. They are not the authority. Jesus taught us. You take the tradition, you run it alongside the word of God. If it contradicts the word of God, you throw away your tradition. It is the word of God that stands. And don't forget that Jesus indicted them and he chastised them for their tradition that made void the word of God, and he said, you're supposed to know this is the truth. Your tradition violates the truth. Jesus apparently believed that you can use the word of God as the standard against tradition and systems of men and understand it. So let's go to the text. And again, this is not exhaustive, but what are we saying with effectual grace? Here it is. Ephesians 2 again. You're by nature children of wrath. You were dead in your sins and trespasses, but God made you alive together with him. What we're saying is that God brings life to dead people. He opens the eyes of the blind. He takes away stony hearts and he gives soft, fleshy hearts. We're saying that God gives the gifts of repentance and faith. Because what does Romans 3 say? There is none who seeks for God. So how do we have all these God seekers? How do we go from non-God seeking to God seeking? Was it you? Were you different? You have more power, more intellect, better understanding, better parents, a better upbringing? Or did God speak light where there is darkness? And bring life where there was death. Couple verses. Matthew 16, 15. We'll go for a popular one. This is a famous one. Matthew 16, 15. This is, of course, the conversation between Jesus and Peter. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. How did he get that information about who Jesus was? Because you, we, we realize that Peter was one of the apostles, one of those originally called disciples, amongst a lot of different Jewish people who were not affirming that Jesus was the Messiah. You realize that there were people who brought Jesus to the cross, and said, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. You realize there were people at the foot of the cross who were denying and saying to Jesus, if you're the Messiah, come off that cross. Right? Show us you're the Messiah. And Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, my father who's in heaven. Next, Matthew eleven twenty five. And yes, go there. Get into your... Uh, your phones or your devices or flip the pages. I, by the way, I love the pages. I love to hear those pages rustling. As Dr. Walter Martin said, it's good for the soul. So let's hear it. Matthew eleven twenty five. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, it's a little above Matthew 25. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things 
from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? The father hiding things from the wise and understanding and revealing them to little children. I thought he doesn't have that prerogative. I thought God has to spread his grace like peanut butter over every person who's ever lived. And Jesus says, Father, I thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Jesus thanks the Father for doing what? Hiding truth from certain people. You've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Who chooses? The Son. Father, you've hid these things from the wise and understanding. And then Jesus says, or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So who's, who's the person in charge of this? The creature or the Son? The Son chooses to reveal. John 6.37, as an anchor verse, I'll just read ahead a little bit. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, again, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up. Acts 5, 31, go there. Acts 5.31. This is an important element of this study because when you look at the book of Acts, you're looking at a book that shows the history of of the Christian church as the Spirit of God is poured out as promised on Pentecost and the church goes out to preach the gospel. What was their understanding about what was happening in front of them? And in Acts chapter 5, this is where Peter tells them we must obey God rather than men. In verse 30, the God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. God has granted repentance. Given repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Repentance has its origin in God's gracious hand and power. People repent because God gives repentance. Acts 11. Acts 11. Move over a little bit. Look at the response of the church. This is a powerful testimony here. In Acts 11, 18. I'll read a little ahead of it so you can see. In verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. So here's an example of what took place when Peter preaches the gospel to the Gentiles. They come to Jesus. They're filled with the Spirit of God. By the way, before they got into the water. And in Acts 11, 15... As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered how the word of the Lord, I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So these Gentiles, I was preaching the gospel, Peter says, Holy Spirit falls on them just like us. They come to believe in Jesus. And the response to Peter telling them what happened was, huh, I guess God has granted repentance that leads to life to the Gentiles. So the church responds to people coming to Jesus and they say, I guess God has granted repentance to them. Who gave that? Gifted that? God did. God gifted Granted repentance to the Gentiles leading to life. Another one, Acts 13, 48. This is a powerful one. I'm going to read a little higher. Uh, 46 is where I'll start. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Isn't that interesting? As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So lots of people there. Lots of people there. Lots of people hearing the message. And certain of them are rejoicing. And certain of them are believing. But the answer from inspired scripture is this. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. That's the power of God's gracious will and plan. Another one. Acts 16, 14. There's the reference. I'll read above it a little bit. As you can see, this consistent testimony from Scripture. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And she was, and after she was baptized and her household as well. So who opened her heart? The Lord opened her heart to believe what was said by Paul. That's the order. God opens the heart. God brings life. God grants this. God gifts this. God appoints to eternal life and people come to Jesus. Another one, you know this one. I hope you know it. Probably have it memorized here at Apology at Church. I hope you do. In Romans chapter 8, you know, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And here it is. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Man-made religion will always lose a step in that. That golden chain of redemption gives glory to God. It displays his power, his purpose, and his will. Man-made religion will always find some way to break the chain. Biblical grace, the biblical gospel, what brings God glory is this golden chain. God foreknows. He chooses to enter into intimate relationship with. It's that whole Acts 13 thing. Those who were predestined, they came. Those who were appointed to eternal life, they believed. Foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. That's God's chain. That's God's chain. And it is a glorious chain. Another one, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You know this one, don't you? Most of you can quote at least part of this, right? What does it say? Ephesians 2. It says, for by grace are you saved, what? Let's say it loud now. By grace are you saved? Now remember, Ephesians 2 exists in the context. We're quoting from the lower part of that passage. By grace you've been saved through faith. But he's already used this terminology in the same chapter. You know what it was? 
by nature children of wrath, dead in your sins and trespasses, but God made you alive together with him by grace you've been saved. So for Paul here in Ephesians 2, that by grace you've been saved has already been made parenthetically after you were dead, God made you alive. So that by grace you've been saved is actually not just God giving gifts for salvation, little ones here or there, it's this. Uh, you're Lazarus in the tomb. You're dead and you stinketh. And Jesus made you alive together with him. By grace you've been saved. Through faith, Paul says, and that, the grace and the faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The grace and the faith, gift of God, not according to works, lest any man should boast. See, all man-made religion wants to ultimately boast in its works, in itself, in its ability. You know why this is so... You know why the flesh is so hostile to this? I believe. I think I could defend this. I think the flesh is so hostile to this message of God's grace because we want the glory. We want some. It's got to be some my direction. This gospel of grace give God, gives God all the glory. It robs you of all of it. It puts you dead at the foot of the cross with no good deeds, no righteousness to speak, to speak of. And it has a holy, sovereign God who gives grace to whom he wills. So he gets all the glory for it. And that's why the flesh resists this. Because it takes away your and my boasting. But the one who knows their condition before a holy God... They know what a wretch they truly are. They know how dead they truly were. They don't want any of this boasting. They want all the glory to go to God. This is a gospel of grace that saves dead people. And all the glory goes to God. But one more verse there because it has to be said. It's always left out, right? You're dead. God made you alive. By grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not according to works. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God has already prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, that's that's it. You see, when God saves, he saves perfectly. He saves the whole way. It's the foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. It's the... Well, it's Paul's hope in Philippians chapter 1. What did we say when we were in Philippians 1 together the whole time? What did I say? I kept going back to it over and over and over. How is he so joyful? How is he in chains and he's so joyful? How is he doing this? And he says this, he that began a good work in you will complete it. Because Paul knows the whole story. This is God's plan. It's to his glory. This is what God does to save. We're his workmanship. He doesn't just save part of the way. He saves the whole way. So yes, there is a a sense in which we've been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Because this is the plan of God the whole way through. Which is also why you have to repudiate the modern evangelical pithy lie of a gospel that says things like, uh, do you want to go to heaven one day? Uh, Pray this magic prayer. You're good. Ticket punch. See you later, bro. Right? 55 years old, ever been to church? No, I was saved when I was eight years old. Really, read the Bible? Nah. You have any hunger for God or spiritual things? No, but I was saved when I was eight years old. What'd that look like? Well, my grandpa sat me on his knee. He said, do you want to burn in hell forever? And I said, no. He said, great. Recite this prayer after me. Saved. That's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. Gospel isn't simply about going to heaven one day. It's about reconciliation with God today. And when God saves, he saves perfectly. And when he saves, he saves and not only declares you righteous, but he joins you to his son. He makes you alive. And the good gifts that he gives are gifts of sanctification and obedience afterwards. Okay, let's go for some more. A couple more. John chapter 1 verse 12. Many of you guys know this already. John chapter 1, verse 12. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, here it is, 
Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's how you were born. God did it. You know what's so crazy? Can we be honest? If you're in Christ today and you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you know what happened in your life. Like, for you, you're just going along your way. Maybe somebody came and preached the gospel to you, gave you a tract. Maybe you're watching something online. You're sitting in church. Maybe you're here right now and God's doing it right now. I don't know where you're at, but you know your experience is you were one direction believing one thing and all of a sudden you saw and you're like, yes, I believe. Or you saw Jesus and, okay, yes, I believe. Now I trust in you. You know your experience. You know how your mind changed. Maybe somebody gave you an argument from Scripture or they, they, they showed an inconsistency in the way you were thinking and all of a sudden the scales came off. You know your experience. You saw Jesus. You trusted in Him. All that's true. But behind it all is a sovereign God who before the world began gave you to Jesus. Behind it all is a Savior who had you in His heart and in His mind When he lived and died and rose again. And behind it all is a person who is spiritually dead and then was born of God so that they could believe. Of course, John chapter 3 is a big one. We don't have time to unpack the whole thing, but I think it's beautiful. Jesus answered him, truly I say, truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? And be born. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Man, that is effectual grace. A hundred proof. What's Jesus quoting from? Water and spirits. He's talking to a Jewish teacher who knows his Bible. Actually, Jesus chastises him for not understanding what he's saying. He's supposed to know this. Jesus is not bringing in a novel doctrine. He's pointing Nicodemus to what he should know. And he says, you've got to be born of the water and the spirits. And Nicodemus is like, what? How? And Jesus is like, "Uh, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know this? Ezekiel 36, God promises in the new covenant. He says what he's going to do is vindicate the holiness of his great name, which they profaned among the nations. And he says this is what he's going to do to vindicate the holiness of his name. He says he's going to sprinkle clean water on them so they'll be clean. He'll cleanse them from all their idols. He says that he will put his spirit within them and cause them to observe his statutes. He'll remove the heart of stone and give the heart of flesh. There is the water and the spirit. What's that referring to? regeneration regeneration it's what the spirit of god is going to do in the new covenant to bring life to dead people and that's what jesus says to nicodemus he says you got to be born again or you'll never see the kingdom of god you must be born from above god has to do this for you to see this for you to believe you've got to be born from above god has to do this john 5 21 for as the father raises the dead and gives them life so also the Son gives life to whom He will. Ephesians 2, we already did a number of times. I won't go back there about being dead in trespasses and sins. But how about Titus 3, 5? But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly, Through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And 1 Peter 1, 3, I'm going faster here, I know, but write down the references. The Apostle says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has caused us to be born again. 1 John 5, 1, last one on this point. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ 
has been born of God. Everyone who believes has been born of God. I want to finish on three points. These are powerful. Verses. You can write them down now. Philippians 1.29. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And 2 Timothy 2, 25. Just a couple points here in terms of the consistent teaching of the inspired apostle on these points. Very important. Now you're already familiar with Philippians 1.29, correct? Because we just had a series through Philippians. Hopefully I talked about that enough and drilled that into us enough. But what does Paul say in Philippians chapter 1, 29? He says, to you it has been granted. We're almost done, so just stay with me on these last points because they're big. When he talks to the church, he says, it's been gifted to you. Gifted to you. Not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. Now stop there for a second. I know that I mentioned it before, before, but for whoever's new, I think a lot of times we don't see the power of that verse because we see the word suffering And we're like, I like the first gift, you can keep the second one. And so we sort of like get out of that verse for a minute. It's been gifted to you not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. So two things come from God, according to the Apostle Paul. Two things come from God, faith and suffering. It's been gifted to you not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. So if you believe in Jesus, that was a gift from God. Do you trust in Jesus? It's been gifted to you. You didn't do that. You didn't earn it. You weren't worthy of it. Neither am I. You weren't looking for it. You weren't righteous enough for it. You weren't good. You weren't different than the other people who are fallen in Adam. It's been gifted to you to believe in Jesus. Granted to you. Gifted to you. But also, it's been gifted to you to suffer for Jesus' sake. Both things. Glorious gifts from God. But the Apostle Paul has a consistent message, doesn't he? About the nature of mankind, the fall, and the gift of faith. Because he does it again in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We were just there. But what's he say? Do it with me now. By grace you've been saved, what? Through faith. And that, not of yourselves. The gift, the grace, and the faith, not of yourself. You didn't do it. You believed, yes. Yes. But you you didn't muster up the spiritual ability to believe in Jesus. You believe because God granted to you eternal life. He gifted to you faith. But this is a powerful one. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Again, consistent theme from the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy 2. Look what the Apostle Paul says here in verse 23. He says this. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So the Apostle Paul here, consistent theme, consistent message. How is this person going to ultimately come to the truth? The Apostle Paul says this, if God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. God does this. God grants repentance. God grants faith. God opens the eyes of the blind. So if you want to know what effectual calling is or effectual grace, it's that. Because remember this, whenever you see in the New Testament, oh, I guess God has granted them repentance that leads to life. Oh, they were ordained to eternal life, so they believed. Remember this, there were lots of other people standing there. It's important to note that. When the word goes out, these people God has granted repentance to, there are other people that were there who remained in their unbelief. And somebody might say, that's not fair. That's not fair. 
And the answer is this. You do not want fair from God. You don't want his justice. Because when we say, I want God to be just with me, we go right to condemnation. What you don't want from God on, for your sake is God's justice on you. And that's the glory of the gospel. God's justice was poured out on Jesus Christ. He received it in the place of his people so that we receive grace and mercy and he received the justice that was due to us. Every human being throughout all of earth's history is a sinner worthy of the wrath of God and his justice, not grace. God doesn't owe anybody grace. You see, the real challenge to this message is to really contemplate and try to figure out how in the world a holy God who is just and good and perfect would be gracious and loving to one. But you know what's even more powerful about this now when you think about it? Because I don't like this. I'll just say this. This is, of course, my perspective. There are Christians who disagree with this. But let me just, I'll put it on record as my perspective. Maybe we could debate this, you know, over coffee um, or something. The promise to Abraham was this. You're going to have descendants as numerous as the stars. It'll be like the sand on the seashore. That's a lot of sand, brothers and sisters. And it's a heck of a lot of stars. And this vision, you know the vision in Revelation, have you read Revelation? The vision in Revelation is there is this vision of the people before the throne of God, and it is a mass of humanity that you cannot even count. No ability to even count it. You see, that to me boggles the mind. We're the sinners, we're the criminals in God's universe, and his plan is to have as numerous as the stars like sand on the seashore, a number before the throne that no one can even possibly count. That's a lot of people that receive the grace of God in Jesus Christ. That's a lot of grace. You know what's even amazing to me is that God saves even one. You see, when somebody remains in their sin and they're hardened against God, it makes sense to me. They're a rebel against their creator. They hate God. They're an enemy of God. They're a child of wrath. I understand it. The thing that is incomprehensible is when the lights come on for this dead one. The thing that's incomprehensible is when all of a sudden the eyes open in this one. The thing that's incomprehensible is to see somebody that is so hostile towards God and now they are in love with Jesus and they're submitted to him and they long for his law and his righteousness. Now they love God and neighbor. That's the incomprehensible thing. And somebody might say, wow, Yes, the Bible teaches this. He grants repentance. He grants faith. He takes dead people. He raises them to life. People have been given to Jesus by the Father, and he will not fail to raise them up. So what's that mean for evangelism? You know what I have to say about that? Power. Please hear me on that. Power. You see, you have two perspectives. Maybe everyone will have their own spin on it. But if you believe that God can try to save... Jesus can die for the sins of the person and the Holy Spirit can try to save them and fail. My question is, what hope do you have in evangelism? If the almighty creator can't thwart their will, then what good are you? You see, the biblical perspective is this. God is sovereign. We're all rebels. We deserve hell. He chose the people in Jesus Christ to give grace to. He ordained them to eternal life. Jesus says, those are mine. I will not fail to get them and raise them up. And the Spirit of God comes into our lives, opens our hearts and eyes to see Jesus, grants the gifts of faith and repentance. We believe God applies that salvation and he preserves us to the end. I say that's a gospel of power and it motivates missions. It motivates missions. Because here's what I know Jesus said. He said this, all authority in heaven and on earth is mine. He says, therefore, go get the nations. And so I know that Jesus has a purpose. He has a plan. And Abraham has descendants as numerous as the stars. And I don't deserve to be in this. But God has a message of the gospel that brings life. And so I'm going to go tell it.
I'm going to go tell it. And no one's going to stop God from saving anybody he wants to save. He has effectual grace and effectual call. So brothers and sisters, go tell the gospel. Go tell the gospel. I love it. People are like, you know, I don't really know the right words. I don't know if I'm going to do this right. I'm not as good as this guy. I've seen guys in the street. They can say this. I don't know all these things. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Go preach the gospel. The power of God for salvation is the good news. So go tell it. Like take it like flowers out of a hat. Just throw them out there. Okay? Gospel, 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 gospel. And you'll see people all of a sudden, life, 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 life. Come into life. Why? Because God uses the bride of Christ to offer the living waters to the world. Whoever's thirsty, come and drink. And all of a sudden, someone will go, hey, I'm kind of thirsty. I don't know why, but I am. And they come and drink, and they have eternal life, and Jesus never loses them. That's a gospel of power and grace. Let's go preach it. Father, I pray that you'd bless the word that went out today for your glory. Help us to understand this. Help us to believe it. Help us to preach it. We praise you for the salvation you've given to us. We love you, Lord. You get to, you get the glory. You get to boast in all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.